Welcome to Family Bible Time. Oh, here we are again in the next most eating chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if that just made life difficult for you at home. We're in the next most depressing chapter in the Bible. Here we are, Rehoboam's Folly. So it starts with Solomon, doesn't it? But now we're going to see Rehoboam blow it, just as God said he would. But the good news is that we're going to also read Philippians chapter 3, which is amazing. Yes, let's go and let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege that we have day by day. Thank you for opening our eyes, that we can see wonderful things in your law. Please open the eyes of our heart, that we can understand all the heights and the depths of the love that you have for us in Christ. Mm -hmm. Please open our eyes so that we can see the truth. Please lead us in the truth. Sanctify us by the truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. Rehoboam went to Shechem, and for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. The Shechem now is a place, not a man. Mm -hmm. And as soon as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard of it, for he was still in Egypt, where he had fled from King Solomon. Then Jeroboam returned from Egypt. And they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and said to Rehoboam, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. He said to them, so This is now. Rehoboam, saying to them, um, Go away for three days, then come again to me. So the people went away. Then King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men who had stood before Solomon his father while he was yet alive, saying, How do you advise me to answer this people? And they said to him, If you will be a servant to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them, when you, are answered, when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. But he abandoned the counsel that the old men gave him and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him and stood before him. And he said to them, What do you advise that we answer this people who've said to me, Lighten the yoke that your father put on us? And the young men who had grown up with him said to him, Thus you shall speak to this people who said to you, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you lighten it for us. Thus you shall say to them, My little think finger is thicker than my father's thighs. Which is kind of saying I'm really, 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 really fat. No, it's not. What's it saying? It's saying I'm strong. I'm, I'm going to be harder and I'm bigger. I'm stronger than my dad. My... Uh, and whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. Well, that was probably a really dumb thing to say. Mm. But Jeroboam um, and... All the people came to Rehoboam on the third day, as the king said, come to me again on the third day. And the king answered the people harshly mm -hmm. and forsaking the counsel that the old men had given him. He spoke to them according to the counsel of the young men, saying, my father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So the king would not listen to the people, for it was a turn of affairs brought, out, brought about by the Lord that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord spoke by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now I'll just stop there for a second. Um, if you're like me, watching the news is depressing. Now, I'm not a politician, and I don't pretend to be a... Um, a very astute one. I, I, I don't even 
think that I would do a particularly good job as I look at international politics and as I look at domestic politics and financial decisions that our leaders are making. I'm very glad that it's not my responsibility. Let me put that in at the front. So I'm not sitting here as an armchair politician, but as, as, a, as a man of the Bible, I think God, if you study the Bible, God gives you certain principles um, and a certain wisdom that so that you can know that certain decisions that people make are good or bad. And very, on a very basic level, I, when I look at the news, I, I, if I could get hold of my hair, I would literally tear it out, I think, sometimes. I find myself literally slapping my forehead in, in dismay and sighing and groaning at the mad, foolish, stupid decisions by some of our leaders. And then I remember Romans 1. And I think, yeah, God has given us over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. Mm -hmm. we, we are in the throes of God's judgment upon our nation. Not just upon our nation, upon our generation. It's not just our leaders. It's the leaders of the civilized world who seem to be making decisions almost calculated... Some people would say they are calculated, but you would think that they would, they almost seem to be calculated to lead us into disaster. And, and I say, yeah, it, this is the kind of situation which is a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord because he had determined, he's determined to fulfill his word. What's his word? His word is Romans 1. Mm. If we embrace that kind of sexual perversion, sexual immorality, which we have embraced, mm. the next step down the rung of God's judgment, the descent into God's judgment, is to be handed over to, to a depraved mind. And that's where we are right now. We, our leaders are making foolish mistakes and decisions which seem calculated to bring about disaster. Why? Because this is a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord. He's judging us. That's my opinion. And I, I don't apologize for it. I'm ashamed of our politicians, but I'm ashamed of the generation that has brought about God's judgment. The old saying is we get the leaders that we deserve. And that's true, isn't it? So, wow, well, we need to pray for them, but boy, we need to be realising that this is how God deals with nations. Um, and and the, the, the decision of Rehoboam is just madness. It's about, it's kind of it's calculated to destroy the nation, and that's what happens. Look at verse 16. And when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, What portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tent, O Israel. Look now to your own house, David. So Israel went to their tents. But Rehoboam reigned over the people of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was taskmaster over the forced labor, and all Israel stoned him to death with stones. And King Rehoboam hurried to mount his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. And when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. When Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chosen warriors, to fight against the house of Israel, to restore the kingdom to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. 
But the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God, say to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, Thus says the Lord, You shall not go up or fight against your relatives, the people of Israel. Every man return to his home, for this thing is from me. So they listened to the word of the Lord and went home again, according to the word of the Lord. Wow. Now, what had God promised Jeroboam, by the way, if he followed him heartily? Yes. Um, he would multiply his family mm-hmm. and rise his family up. He'd give him a name just like David. God had promised Re- uh, Jeroboam a kingdom and a name and a, an inheritance like David's. But he said, if you follow me, and he said, I've chosen Jerusalem. That's where I've put my name. So there's no change to the place of worship. And every year, everyone had to go up to Jerusalem to worship. But now Jeroboam, now that the kingdom's divided, Jeroboam doesn't want everyone to go up to Jerusalem to worship. So look what happens. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. And he went out from there and built Penuel. Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will return back to the house of David if this people go up to offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then the heart of this people will turn again to their lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, the king of Judah. So how much did he believe God? (laughs) Not a bit. Mm -hmm. So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold, because that had such a good history in the nation of Israel. That worked before. That worked so well before for them. Um, And he said to the people, You have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Whoa. Mm. Where, where's that been said before? This was, this was what Aaron did, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Making a golden calf. Mm-hmm. Now he makes two golden calves. And verse 29, he set one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. Oh, hold on a minute. Mm -hmm. We went to Dan, didn't we? What did we see in Dan? We saw, like, the structure where the um, calf would have been. So we saw the base of the altar, didn't we? Those stones with the base of the altar. And then on top of the altar, they've made a reconstruction, haven't they? They've made it out of metal so that you get an idea of how big the altar would have been. But they found the spot. This is not in question. And that's really really scary, isn't it? Right there. Mm-hmm. Up, right up in Dan. Where is Dan? Right up in the north. Mm-hmm. Where's Bethel? Oh, right down in the south. So what's he doing? So he's, he's putting a place of worship at both ends so that the people of Israel don't have to go all the way to Jerusalem to worship God. And now he's making a false god and saying, Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. So he's making a false claim that this idol is Mm. the god who brought them out of the land of Egypt. Mm. You say, well, who would be so stupid as to fall for that? Mm -hmm. Oh, just like most of them. It's terrible, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But this is the reality. Then this thing became a sin for the people went for the people went as far as Dan to be before one. He also made temples on high places and appointed priests from among all the people who were not of the Levites. And Jeroboam appointed the a feast on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, like the feast that was in Judah. And he offered sacrifices on the altar, so so he did in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places that he had made. He went up to the altar that he had made in Bethel on the fifteenth day of the eighth month, in the month that he had devised from his own heart. 
And he instituted a feast for the people of Israel and went up to the altar to make offerings. Hmm. What's going to happen tomorrow? Mm. Well, we'll see. <laughs> yes. Uh, we, we didn't actually recount all of that when we were in Dan, did we? Because we were in today. such a rush. Yes. So but we, t we went up to Dan by bus. Oh, that's funny. And it, our, we missed our connection en route because the bus we got to start with was late. So then we ended up stuck by the side of the road for a while, an hour or so. And then we ended up missing the next connection and then taking a taxi instead. So by the time we actually got to this place, it was just about to close, wasn't it? And then we were rush, rushing around and we ended up hitchhiking. But it was fun, right? It was fun? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. <laughs> well, it was kind of daddy fun, but I think you both enjoyed it. Did you enjoy it? it was a fun day. Genuinely? Good. Should we do it again? <laughs> <laughs> There we go. All right. Finally, my brothers. Oh boy, this is so, so good. Here we are in Philippians chapter three. I love this because <laughs> this is right in the middle of the book. And Paul says, finally. What's so funny about that? It's just like <laughs> some of us preachers do, of course. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me, and it is safe for you. Don't be afraid of repetition, because repetition is the key to learning. And the key to learning is repetition. Very good. Look out for the dogs. Did you see that? Look out for the evildoers. It's just interesting, isn't it? Because dogs in the Bible are... Kind of a picture of evil does but then if you grow up where most of the dogs are wild dogs and you know not safe there's a poor poor family in america just now where their family pet pit bull terror terriers pit bull terrorers yes mauled their two children to oh, death and nearly killed the mother a dog, they, they had two pit bulls and they had a, a baby, an infant and a toddler and both the children were killed and the mother was badly mauled trying to defend the children against this prolonged hmm. attack from both dogs Thanks. who'd been pets for five years and never hurt anyone before and everyone said they were just no danger at all. But a pit bull is a pit bull. A dog is a dog is a dog. You can never fully trust a dog. Remember that. As, much, as lovely as our dog is, she's still a dog. Mm -hmm. And dogs will do what dogs will do. So don't, mm -hmm. don't humanize them. Anyway, the Bible doesn't do that. The Bible says, look out for the dogs. Now, what does it mean? Actually, it's not talking about dogs. Um, <coughs> The Bible is dogifying humans at this point, not humanizing dogs. Mm. And it's saying that some people are like dogs. Now, so now you have to imagine not our dog, who's lovely and gentle and obedient. Kind of hard to <laughs> do. Now you have to imagine not our dog, but people who have the nature of these kind of wild, unruly dogs. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. What is he talking about? Mutilating the flesh. He's not just talking about people who do body piercings. He's talking about people who insist on circumcision in order to be saved. And then you can get that from the context because he says, For we are the real circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Now these people, they were, Paul's calling them dogs. Elsewhere he says, I wish they'd go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Uh, he's saying, these people are saying, you've got to be circumcised in order to be saved. And Paul says, they're just like 
dogs, they're waiting to devour you. They're waiting to eat you. Watch out for them. There are, there are people out there, and we've said this to you before, you just have to remember this. There are people out there who will teach things and try to persuade you about things, but actually they're like dogs who just want to eat you. Mm-hmm. That's terrifying. But Paul says, watch out for them. And, and in this case, the issue is circumcision. And they wanted, to, they put confidence in the flesh. They thought that by keeping these rules, uh, they, could, they could be saved. Mm. And he says, we are the real circumcision, who, who glory in Christ and, and worship by the Spirit and have put no confidence in the flesh. Though, verse 4, I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Now he's going to give them his Jewish credentials. Circumcised on the eighth day, that's what the law required, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Now that's interesting, isn't it? We've just been reading about the tribe of Benjamin, haven't Mm -hmm. we? And Saul, Paul, was a descendant of the tribe of which King Saul was the king. A Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness, under the law, blameless. Now that, by the way, is quite a claim. Mm. So Paul, speaking the truth here, says that as to righteousness, under the law, as far as the, 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 the external compliance with the law was concerned, he was blameless. In other words, he just did everything fastidiously. He made sure that he kept all of the rules. That's what the Pharisees do. But whatever gain I had, so any so-called gain from all of that, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. In other words, all that stuff which seemed to be doing me good, actually, I consider that not as loss now. I consider that as actually a bad like it's it, it didn't help me. It was negative instead of positive, mm. for because of Christ, for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss, because of the surpassing surpassing worth, surpassing <laughs> worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. Mm. Now, stop there for a second, because this is just too good to be true. It's so simple, so clear. What is Paul saying? The righteousness that I have is not my own. It is not not my own that comes from the law, from keeping the law. But I have a righteousness that comes through faith in Christ, which is f- from, uh, from which comes through faith faith in Christ. The righteousness from God, in other words, a righteousness which we receive, not a righteousness that we achieve, not a righteousness that you gain by keeping the law and winning as a prize. It's a righteousness that you receive as a gift from God and it comes through faith in Christ. It depends on faith. So it's when you believe that you receive, not when you achieve, because none of us achieve. Mm -hmm. Simple, isn't it? Absolutely revolutionary. How many, are you perhaps, I don't know, all of you watching, are you perhaps still secretly trying in your own mind to think, oh, if only I could achieve and God would be pleased with me and then, oh, but I can't. You know you can't, don't you? Maybe you're so proud you think you have. Well, you need to get real and look at the Bible and see your own sin for what it is. But if you're realistic about yourself, you know you're a sinner and you know you can't achieve it. And, and in your conscience, you can be tortured thinking that that's what you've got to do. Listen, give it up. You need a righteousness that comes to you from God. And you receive it by faith. 
So what, what does it mean to receive it by faith? Now we've done this before, haven't we? Remember Spurgeon's story about the watch. Should we do it again? Spurgeon, uh, I, I, don't, I know some of you are new to family Bible time, but let me tell you this story again. Spurgeon had a watch. It was a pocket watch, not a wrist watch, but he was teaching a Sunday school class. And he came in and he's, he, at the beginning of the class, he took out his watch and he put it on the table and he said, whoever wants it can take it. And all his Sunday school children just looked at him and they looked round at each other and none of them did anything until eventually one plucky little lad reached out his hand and took the watch. And you know what Spurgeon did? He said nothing about it and he just carried on teaching his Sunday school lesson. And during the Sunday school lesson you can imagine the glances, can't you? You can imagine the looks. They were looking at each other and they're looking at him and they're wondering when he's going to talk about the watch. And he's not talking about the watch. And at the end of the Sunday school lesson, he dismissed the class. He said, OK, you can go. But none of them left. And so they all stood, stood there waiting and they looked at Spurgeon and, and they said, but sir, he still got your watch, sir. And that's when Spurgeon taught them the real lesson. He said, no, he said, you, I said, whoever wants it can have it. And he believed me and he took it. So it's his. You obviously didn't believe me, so you didn't take it. Now, what's the point? The point is that that plucky boy believed the word that Spurgeon said when he said, it's free. You, whoever wants it can have it. And so that plucky boy reached out his hand and took it. He took it by faith. Well, the others didn't, so they didn't receive it. Mm. But he received it and he... He, he, he can't say he earned it, can he? He can't say that he achieved it, can he? He, he can only say he, he received it by faith. Faith is the hand, Spurgeon said, that reaches out and takes the gift. So if you give me the watch, if I reach out my hand and take it from you, thank you very much, you fell for that one nicely, um, that's me taking it back because it belongs to me. No, <laughs> it's me taking it by faith. So if I gave it to you, I had £10 in my pocket and I handed it to you and you took it, you'd be taking it by faith. You'd say, my dad, he's so generous. <laughs> he's just giving me £10, I'll take it. All right. <laughs> well... I'll leave that one where it is. <laughs> when was the last time I gave you ten pounds? Um, <laughs> okay. Here's the deal. This is about your salvation, isn't it? So, have you received salvation by? F have you have you received righteousness by faith? God gives it you need it so, so have you asked for it have you gone to god repenting of your sin you've got to repent of your sin haven't you you know that mm. this is this is not a deal in which god is mocked god is not going to say to you oh well, you can keep your sin and have my righteousness mm. no, he sent jesus to the cross to die for your sin you've got to be willing to give up your sins but you know you're going to fail you know you're still going to sin you know you're going to you, you, you are a sinner, and you will be till the day you die, but you must turn from your sin. You can't do that perfectly even, but you must do it. You must turn away from your sin. But you don't earn your righteousness by turning away from your sin. All you do is say, God, yes, I believe you. I repent. I give it up now. And please forgive me. And, and God in his mercy gives you righteousness. And you say, well, how do I get it? Will you receive it by faith? You say, thank you, Lord. Have you done that? Have you received the gift of righteousness by faith? Mm -hmm. Look, if you believe that Jesus died on that cross for you, God declares you righteous. It's a done deal. Now, do you believe that? If you're going to take God at his word, rejoice, because it's yours as a gift. 
And it's not earned, it's received by faith. And here we are. So clear, isn't it? Now, um, here's where it's interesting. So not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. That I may know him. Now, Paul, what, Paul, what is Paul saying? Back up a minute. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, verse 8, and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. There's part one. And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, and so on. Now, this is part two, verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. So Paul wants to be sure that he's, he's received that righteousness and also that he knows God and the power of his resurrection, so the power working in, in Paul's life, making him new, and may share in his sufferings. Uh-oh. This is a package deal, isn't it? Mm. Are you willing to suffer for Christ? Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. Paul says, I want that. I, I, I want to share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death that by any means possible I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already attained, obtained this, or am already perfect. So Paul was sinning still, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus made, it, made me his own. Isn't that lovely? I press on to make it my own. I want to be like him, and even suffer for him if that's his will. Why? Because he's made me his own. He saved me. Brothers, I do not consider that I have already made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Those of us who are mature think this way. Let those of us who are mature think this way. And if, any, and if, if anything you think otherwise, well, that's your truth and this is my truth. No, he didn't say that. God will reveal that to you also. <laughs> In other words, God will set you right. Mm. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me. and Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I've often told you now, and now tell you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. And they glory in their shame, with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. Amen. Mm -hmm. By the power that enables him in even to subject all things to himself. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm looking forward to that day. And are you? Lord, we look forward to the day when you will transform our lowly bodies to be like your glorious body. And we praise you that you're set on that, Lord. We pray that you would come quickly. And Lord, we pray that like Paul, we would strain towards the prize, the upward call of Christ. Help us to live to bring this good news to others, we pray. And we pray, Lord, that you'd save some, even people that are listening to this. Lord, save people who still haven't yet repented and received the gift of righteousness by faith. We ask for them for that now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, we're done. Amen. And we will see you, God willing, tomorrow. Some of you will see in person, God willing, tomorrow. Um, well, the rest of you, goodbye, God bless. <laughs> you got it right again. I got it right, despite the dark. <laughs>